today as you can see we're looking at a Nintendo Famicom a family computer they're really nice these are it's the first time I've ever seen one um, in real life you know you see them online and they look quite large it's surprising how small they are you know if you look at the size of the cartridge here from a NES um, they're, they're tiny really they're just not not big at all um, the interesting thing is you'll see at the front here you've got a connector and it's like a 15 uh, pin D type um, by the looks of things. So you have got um, one port here on the front for a connector and I did get a, con uh, a controller with this. Um, it looks like Hudson soft there, the Hudson logo. So that's quite nice, it's like a third party aftermarket controller I think. Um, with auto fire as well, so I've tested that, that works okay. It just needs cleaning up I think. Uh, there's a, I think there's a couple of screws missing so I'm not sure what's happened there. Maybe the supports inside have broken because I did find a screw floating around in the box. Um, but anyway, that seems to work. Um, this has obviously got the um, lever missing here, but I've managed to source one of those, so I've got one on the way for that, so I think that's the only missing part. You can see I'm using um, a standard NES um, cart here with one of these adapters. So I think these are about £10-ish, roughly. Um, you, you need to do, well, ideally, you should consider, if you get one of these, consider doing a mod to it. I forget where it is now. I think there's, you can see there's two pins joined down here and there's two pins joined there. In order to get expansion audio and to get MMC5 support, I think you've got to break the traces between the two, the ones that are joined up there, and feed some wires and a, a user resistor to feed the audio, you know, the expansion audio out part there. Um, and that should work with the, like a, an EverDrive if you've got the expansion um, audio there. I think you do, I think they all have the expansion audio on the EverDrive actually. I, can't, I don't remember doing a mod to the EverDrive itself, I think it just outputs it. Um, so yeah, I will be doing a mod to this. Um, I'll perhaps wrap that up on a video on its own, but um, it should go up around the same time as this video, I think. Um, so we'll come on to that later, but yeah, this just allows me to put the 72-pin NES carts um, into the adapter and then plug the adapter into the, I think it's 60-pin, 60 60-pin. 60 um, Famicom slot there, so this works, I'll show you in a second. Um, now bear in mind these output um, NTSC, you know it's Japanese, NTSC J, uh, NTSC J um, out the back there of the aerial lead. So I will be doing a composite mod to this uh, as the part of this video. Um, I need to have the, the sound composite, you know, the standard audio output as well. Uh, I'm not sure whether I should do a stereo um, or not. You can actually, if you remove the, the um, CPU, I think it's pins 1 and 2 that provide the uh, audio output, it might be one, two and three, I think there's three pins, three outputs there, so you can actually, you know, use those and use capacitors and merge one of the channels across the other two and have stereo output, so I might do that. Um, whether things worth pointing out with this actually, um, and I didn't realise this until today, you've got little, um, well you can see, little recesses in the side here, I was like, what's, what's that all about, and then it suddenly dawned on me, it's this exact same profile as the controller, so your controllers can sit in the side there, that's like, that's really neat, I've never seen that before. Um, so the controllers themselves are wired into the back, you know, there's no um, plug or anything, they're just, you know, it's just a wire coming straight out the damn thing. Um, which could be a problem if your controllers aren't working, but yeah, these do both work, they just need cleaning up, I think. The pads and things are not that great, you know, you press right, I think, on both of them, and it's, you've got to press it quite hard and then it works. Um, but on the first controller, uh, sorry, this is the second controller, as you can see, it's got two there. The face is quite good, it's in good condition. We've got a volume slider which is interesting. Um, what's curious about that is why would you give player 2 the volume control? <laughs> because if you look at this, player 1 doesn't. Player 1's got select and start, whereas player 2 hasn't. And player 2 seems to have the mic. So, yeah, a little bit weird uh, when you compare to, you know, the European and uh, US um, NES, you know, the Nintendo Entertainment Systems. The face show on this one, obviously, is completely shot. So, I mean, I'll clean it up, but I think it's, it's worn off, it's like a metal coating or something, I think it's worn off, I don't think that's corrosion, I think it's just gone, the paint, uh, but I'm not that bothered, I'll clean, I will clean them up, so they should look a lot better with them being cleaned, you know, there's lots of dirt and stuff as you can see in here, again, the buttons don't work that well, but it's functioning, um, yeah, so it's, it's just really weird, again, select and start, player one, but not player two, that's good for player one, because player two can't annoy you uh, by pausing the game and stuff, um, that's quite cool, but I just think, I found it a bit strange. You'd think the volume and the microphone perhaps would be on the first one. Um, maybe it's a trade-off. <laughs> maybe it's well. I've got the select to start button as well. You know, screw you. I've got the volume control. If you don't pause it, I'm going to turn the volume off. <laughs> I don't know. So it's looking a bit yellowed. This. Um, not sure whether it's superficial, like it is on the PC Engine, where just put it in some. Um, 
vanish um, will bring it back up to you know the white level or whether it needs retro brighting I suspect it might need a bit of retro bright actually but I don't think I'm gonna bother it's not that bad um, but I will clean it up it's obviously pretty filthy um, regards power supply I think you need like a 9 or 10 volts DC um, and it just so happens that a mega drive um, power supply will work on these so I think with it having a 7805 probably inside it, I'll probably do a similar thing to do the PC engine, get a dedicated 9 volt power supply. God, that's the first time I've seen that happen. <laughs> Just from tilting it, do you see that? There's, there's a little flap there for the uh, cartridge. I'll see if I can show you this. Let's just take that out, presumably it covers it up. Yeah, I didn't realise that. Um, that was purely accidental. Um, anyway, I'll power it up now, show you it working. But as I say, uh, I cut myself a bit off before and I was talking about the video output, it's NTSC J. Uh, my TV will display that, but there's no sound, and I think it's probably because the sound's on a different carrier or something, it's a different frequency. Um, but my TV will display an NTSC picture. So I'll switch it on. As you can hear, TV is making a, a racket there because obviously it's just picking up noise, so I'll just mute that. But as you can see, uh, that seems to be working. I've hit start. There you go. That's loaded okay. Let's see if I can uh, control this. Might not be easy. Hello again. So yeah, aside from the fact we're getting no sound and a really, really fuzzy RF signal there, um, it does seem to be working, which is not bad considering it was described as faulty. I think with the reference to the faulty, I think it perhaps just meant the button was missing off the front of it. Um, you know, the, the eject lever thing. But yeah, that seems to be working. Right, it's not very clever on this D-pad. I need to clean up the buttons and things. So there's going to be lots of things to take apart here. Um, and I think that's what I'm going to do first. I think I'll start disassembling it. Um, as, you know, so that I can start to do the composite mod there. Um, at the same time, I'll just show you some of the insides of this as we go along. So, in order to get inside this, it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, uh, five, six screws. In case you're wondering, the serial number thing under here says it's a HVC002, but on the case molding, it's a HVC001. So, I'm not sure if this was a slightly later revision of the, you know, these initial systems here. So I've got the screws out there, let's just uh, see if we can separate this now, I'm not sure the best way to do this, it looks like it might be hinged at the back or something. Uh, okay, yeah, it's just this comes off, it's the grommets I think that hold, um, it's the grommets there that just hold the back part and can give, you know, a bit deceptive, it makes you think it's stuck, but actually it's not, it's just the grommets holding it. Um, but as we can see there's two PCBs, so we've got the modulator board at the back here, um, and I think the guide I've seen actually is the, the best one seems to be on the assembler games forum I'll post a link to it down below um, and it involves removing a load of components around here I think it's about I don't know, six or seven at least components um, adding a resistor and a cap I think on there and then doing a mod to the top board uh, you know the logic board here as well um, the, where the video output goes through a transistor I think you, you do something there a couple of, again involving a resistor, a bit of a wire link, uh, maybe breaking a trace, I can't remember. But uh, yeah, it doesn't look too bad that, this um, bit of flux on there that perhaps needs cleaning off. But I'm amazed how small the board is there, that's tiny. So I think we'll, we'll unscrew um, the cart, those things there that hold the cart part on, and the screws down here. And hopefully we should be able to get the, the main board out. I probably need to unscrew the, uh, the four screws there as well, because they're joined up, you know, the two boards are joined up by this ribbon here, as you can see. And there we have it. Uh, the board is just tiny. I'm amazed how small that is. You know, when you compare to uh, like a normal, you know, European uh, NES, the, the PCB is much bigger than those systems. Uh, it makes me wonder what on earth's on there that doesn't need to be on there. Um, so, not clear as to what, what's what here because not very uh, visible. So, there's not much on these boards. You've got uh, some SRAM up top here. Uh, some 74 Logic, uh, 74 LS373, um, 74 HC139, is that a DMUX? I think it is. Um, your PPU, sorry that's another S on there, PPU's here, uh, PPU 2C02, um, and then your CPU's down here, that's the other 40 pin chip, and that's a 2A03. Um, we've got um, two identical chips here, 40. H368, so I'm not sure what those are, I might look those up in a minute. There's a lot of fluff and dust and stuff on here, so yeah, I'm going to clean this board up, definitely. 
So the other thing you might notice is there's no CIC chip on the Famicom, um, and that was because it was almost like an afterthought from Nintendo when they wanted to control the markets, you know, the different markets as they once they decided to try and sell them in the West, in Europe, and in the US. Um, that's why I think they went with a 72 pin connector and added the CIC stuff, which you know ultimately you know invokes a reset if the CIC um, you know is not synced, you know, if you've not got the right key and uh, lock type communication going on between the CIC chip on the cart and the CIC chip on the motherboard. Um, so it's just interesting that there's none of that on here at all, so you could probably probably run anything, I would think. The only limitations you're going to have are the clock speed of the, CP, uh, the CPU and the PPU might dictate whether some games give you graphical artifacts, etc. Because that's one of the reasons why I went for this. I've got a PAL NES, and whilst I can run anything on it, one or two games, are, well, quite a few games actually, the ones from the US and NTSC, regions um, they will play but either the, the sound you know the frequency of the sound and things is slightly off um, or you get graphical corruptions and things at certain points in the game certain games actually are not playable because of timing issues to do with sprites and the positioning of sprites on the screen so this is a good reason if you've got a European PAL system you know you want to get something that will uh, play the 60 Hertz games properly from both US and J Japan regions go for a Famicom it's far easier because let's like say you've not got the CIC stuff either you could just need to get one of those adapters as I shown earlier in order to uh, you know use your 72 pin uh, cars and things on it. Well, the other interesting thing is I think these supported expansion audio um, off the shelf. So there's a particular pin in these car in the 60 pin cars here that feed, that merge the audio I think with the audio output. So you know some of the cards, uh, the game cards, you know not cards, cards. Some of the cartridges you can get for the uh, this original Famicom. They've got their own sort of sound hardware on board. You know things like the Konami VRC7. Is it? So it's had a quick clean with some cotton buds there. Uh, I'll show you actually the pretty pretty dirty actually, filthy. Um, so I think the next thing I'm going to do, I'm waiting for the resistors at the moment that I need, um, so I'll probably start cleaning up one of the controllers I think, we'll have a look at the first controller. So we'll look at this one first, the Hudson one, um, and we'll just remove the remaining, remaining screws, I think there's two that are already missing there, one of them I've got, uh, it's just the corner ones. So there we go, that's all the screws out, uh, I just have to pull this. Off air, I think, hopefully. Yeah, that should now come out. So, yeah, nice uh, PCB there. Obviously, I need to clean these contacts up. They're looking a bit oily and stuff. I don't know if you can see that. This a funny sort of silver sort of colour to these ones, as well as the, the other ones are more coppery. So, I'm not sure what's going on there, but yeah. Um, I think this has been cleaned at some point because there's some paper tissue or something there. So, perhaps someone's had a quick go at trying to clean these themselves. Um, kind of reminds me of the uh, PC Engine controller on the inside of this actually. Um, so yeah, I need to clean up these. Can you see these contacts here for the uh, auto fires? I'll, I'll clean those up. You kind of just need to, you know, use like a wire brush or something just to get the contamination off the surface there. Maybe some deoxit or something like that. Um, but with these, the carbon pads here, they just need a gentle wipe with a cotton bud with a tiny bit of IPA. Just, I mean, really white, gentle wipe. You don't want to rub the surface off them, but they seem okay. The uh, silicon, you know, the rubber part is still in place on the outside to these, so that should be good. So I'll just give this PCB a gentle clean here. So that one's all cleaned and reassembled. Um, you can see the little masks inside, they can flip them two ways, so if you flip them around the other way, the way that they've not been used in all years, they look brand new. Uh, you know, it's like perfect black plastic underneath. Um, yeah, I'm pleased with that. Uh, I can't test it until obviously I reassemble everything, but yeah, I'm going to move on to the next one now, we'll do the player one. So just like the other one, held together with six screws, you can see it's a bit dirty, it needs a good clean up, so uh, very much like the last one really, and the PCB's a bit different, it's not got the copper contacts there, it's got these ones with a little sort of carbon type pads or something that are stuck on the top, so I'll have to be careful I don't uh, wipe too much with IPA there, it's just a gentle wipe with uh, cotton buds. Yeah, the silicon bits on these buttons are disgusting, now you can see I've just wiped that just off that side there like that, it's uh, yeah, oh god it's really bad this, this one. So the one thing I did discover that uh, both of these D-pads, can you see, it's split there. Um, the other one's split in two directions. So, And the fact that one of the screws was missing made me realise that actually someone's had these apart and swapped the, um, 
the d-pads around so that's really annoying I think the seller um, must have thought okay well I'm gonna sell these a scrap I'm gonna take some of the you know swap them around take take some of the uh, take a faulty one out of a faulty controller put it in there take the good one out put it in something else so um, if you know where to get these for the Famicom and I, th I believe just looking at that now that looks identical to the one that's in the PC engine controllers um, yeah if you know where to get them replacements please let me know post down below so my pads are all cleaned up and reassembled there, and they're working fine. Um, the, I've ordered some replacement uh, D-pad, you know, the silicon part for the underside, so you can skip what I said earlier on. Um, it might still be worth useful, actually, if you um, could, you know, let me know where you get yours from. But I've just ordered some cheap ones from China um, off AliExpress, so we'll see what those are like. Um, because they are both on the last legs of those D-pads. The buttons, I think, are okay, um, as are the, the select and start button. Um, but I've not got quite got the right resistors yet, I've got some on order so that hopefully they'll arrive in the next day or two but in the meantime I've got some that are approximately the right value I think instead of the 120 I've got 150 and instead of the 200 I've got a 220 so and I think there's probably a 220 on the board actually so we can always just use the one that's on there swap it around um, but I will swap out for the exact uh, sizes once those arrive so looking at the board here now I think the first thing I need to do is remove that 220 and put a jumper across it so I'll use the you know the leg off this resistor here um, I'm gonna put the 220 over here because they're supposed to have a 200 here for this mod uh, and remove that 2.2k so the 2.2k surplus requirements I think at this point but it's just convenient that I can I can move the 2 220 over it's almost 200 so it's not quite right I will put a 200 in there when it arrives so that's the 220 it should be a 200 ohm um, and then we've got a wire link where the previous resistor was there so I removed that selection of components there from the underneath the PCB and you can perhaps just about see, I haven't cleaned this yet with an IPA, you can just about see where the uh, points were, where these came off. Um, around there sort of thing. Um, so we've got this resistor across here, I will need to swap it out for a different size, I think it's 150 instead of 150, uh, so instead of 120 ohms. Uh, I need to put a cap on there now, so I've got a couple of caps. Um, there's a 47 I think to go on the underside of the logic board and a 220 to go on here somewhere down here, so just do that. So I'm getting near the end now, I've got my sound output there going from pin 46 on the cartridge uh, port there and it's actually marked, I'm not going to zoom in, you can, it says 45 there on the uh, uh, you know, the PCB mask. Um, so just temporarily here I've just got it going to a crappy connector, this isn't how I'm going to leave it, it's just to test it. So as you can see it's working that, and the mic's working on the, the second uh, control, I'll turn that on. That's it, it's off. Um, yeah, really annoying that mic. I thought there was a problem because if you listen, hang on, turn it back on. It's picking up noises from the TV. You know, the sound goes back round, so you get like pops and crackles. So anyway, I switched that mic off. Um, the music's obviously very fast because this is a PAL game playing on a, obviously the Japanese uh, Famicom here. So I don't know whether the picture will improve slightly when I've got the exact size resistors in there. I suspect it might just is a tiny tiny bit better but actually I'm pretty pleased with that already for composite it doesn't look dissimilar to my NES so I'll get the EverDrive in there I'll test a few games um, I just need to work on let's say getting the final few parts now getting the a proper composite um, you know a Bono socket on there uh, so I need to order one of those um, I might even do the stereo mod at the same time I don't know it's not absolutely required so while I'm here, I'm going to replace that 1000 microfarad cap and the 1 microfarad cap on the, the regular uh, board here. This gets really hot the Mega Drive power supply, so I'd, it's the same thing as my PC Engine video. I'd recommend using a dedicated 9 volt DC power supply, so I'm going to use the one from the PC Engine for the moment. That will work, it's got the right polarity, and I'll just order another one dedicated for this. So the other thing I had to do here, you might just be able to see it, there's a tiny bit of solder inside there you know I, I took the PC that be out here and just put a tiny bit of solder to hold the this metal part of the sorry this metal part here of the connector onto the surrounding shielding because it wasn't joined properly there was actually a hairline crack all the way around the whole connector so the ground was like a, a you know loosely connected ground and that was one of the reasons the picture was pretty fuzzy um, but in the next part I'll swap out the resistors um, I might put a different connector on here you can see what I've got for the moment is just this um, connector flying out the back here it's just on a very short lead so as you can see that made a big difference to the picture actually fixing that uh, RF uh, 
fitting there. It's, it wobbles a bit, you can see uh, just up the top here, you get like a little shimmer, you know, it's like the sync's not brilliant on that composite signal, but it's, uh, it works okay, you know, the colours are pretty good, it's just the sort of ex what you'd expect really for composite, you know, it's just a bit, a bit blurry, um, but actually considering that's not with the right size resistors in there, it's pretty damn good at the moment. Uh, swapped out the, uh, the resistor there with a proper 120 ohm resistor. Uh, as you've seen, it's been previously working alright with the uh, 150 ohm, but I thought let's just get the uh, the right size components in there. So I've still got the 220 to do on this board. Yeah, so my buttons have arrived. Um, so I'm going to swap out uh, the D pads uh, and the buttons and things on these controllers. Um, they're pretty good, these actually. They're not bad. Uh, There's only a few pounds, this for like a pack of 10, you know, so I've got like 10 lots of the D pads, 10 of the normal buttons and 10 of the start selects. I think the start selects are a bit weak actually, I'm not that impressed with those, they're pretty pretty flimsy compared to the originals, but these are actually, they're not too bad, so hopefully, hopefully they will fit. Um, I think that it says they do NES and Famicom, so I don't know whether they've used exactly the same parts, I'm not sure, I'll soon find out. So as you can see, I've got the replacement eject uh, lever on there now, that's uh, working really fine. Um, one thing you've got to be careful of, and I'll show you in the inside in a minute, you've got to be careful of the wire um, for the on-off switch, uh, sorry, that's the on-off switch, doesn't get in the way of the eject mechanism, uh, so I'll show you that if I just turn this upside down, uh, turn the bottom off. Um, you can see, you know, the on-off switch wire comes up here, and if you're not careful, as I say, when you eject it, I'll just see if I can show you this, as you push the eject lever, you know, that's that's as far as it'll go normally. It's, the wire's not interrupting it there, I don't think. Let's just try and move it across a little bit. Just double check that. Yeah, there you go. You can see that's the extent that you can move it. So it's not easy to move that. So if you do a little bit of grease, I think. Um, and the other thing to point out, just do that on there, so, um, is to get it on there. You can, can you see down there? There's just like a little, uh, there's a clip, you know, that stick out on each side and they go on the underside of there if you like so you've got to you know so you've got to sort of force it in a little bit really you get the center part of the thing in position and then you've got to just uh, use like a flat blade screwdriver or something just to edge the, the sides in and it clips in um, but yeah it can perhaps do with a bit of grease just to stop it making that sort of plastic on plastic uh, sound there so I might do that I might just get a little bit of grease in there um, I think these rails had a bit of grease on to start with actually just on the underside here because um, they were a bit black when I took them off and there was something on them so I think that's what it was um, I don't think it needs it on the top side just this bottom side here is you know as it presses onto the uh, edge of the uh, you know the cart fit in there um, so there's a few things I've done here I've removed the cap there was a cap from I think it was pin 22 um, which is the reset line to ground that's what it showed in the um, you know the composite mod um, I post the link you know, to that down below, I think it was at Assembler Games. I thought that's a bit weird, really. Um, I found that it's, the picture's not any different with or without that cap. Uh, not quite sure why someone would have thought that, or thinks that the reset line is interfering with the video signal, um, and, you know, it's a good idea to stick a cap on there. It, it did cross my mind that you might get some unusual things with the reset, actually having a cap across there, because, you know, when the reset line goes high, the cap's going to charge up. Um, so it's almost like extending the reset. I'm not sure what the implications of that are. Now, with the problems I was having with my EverDrive N8 on this, I, I wanted to rule it out anyway. And it's like I say, the picture's no different with or without that cap, so I'm not sure why they did that. And rather than just uh, do away with the cap, you know, put it away, I thought I'll reuse it in another position on the board. So I put it across the VCC and ground connections here, uh, because there's no, I can't see a cap on this board. There's one here uh, on the output, this regulator. That's the 1000 microphone cap, but there's nothing either nearby the CPU or PPU, so I thought, well, if anything, it'd be useful to stick it there. But it doesn't need to be there, to be honest. Um, so, um, the final thing I need to do to this now, I have recapped it, I've replaced the 1000 microphone cap there. I think there's a one microphone cap on this board as well. Uh, there's one microphone cap somewhere up here, I think. I'll, I'll take this board back out again in a minute because uh, I've got some of these 0.47 microphone caps and this is the final electrolytic on here that needs replacing. So I'll show you that. You've seen it before, but just for people that are not sure how you replace all these caps, I'll show you. Um, I think the, the 0.47 is on the reset circuit probably because it's very small. It's got to be, it's got to be, um, I think. Uh, so, yeah, I'll get this board out now and we'll replace that final cap. 
So I've got the board out here now, so I could just show you quickly. Uh, that one microfiber cap I've swapped out already, it's this 0.47 down here. Um, and as I mentioned previously, the two that are on the uh, modulator and you know regular board here have been done as a 1000 uh, and a 1 microfarad. And I think there was a cap I added actually as part of the video circuit there, as part of that uh, tutorial on the assembler games thing. On assembler games it shows you it, the cap on this side of the board and I've actually stuck it on the underside. I think it might be these contacts somewhere around here, I can't quite remember. So that's the first point, let's just do this one now. So give that a brush. Yeah, hopefully that cap should come out now. You can see the right hand pin's moving, but the left one's still got a bit of solder on it there. So if we just uh, heat that and pull it from the other side. There we go. It's out. So I've just checked continuity here, just for my own peace of mind, and the connection on this side is ground. You know, it's the common ground on the board, so that's going to be the negative on the cap. One thing I found with these replacement um, pads, I don't know if you can see, the. it's really hard to, to get this on shot, but there's a very slight difference in the height, by I don't know, a quarter of a millimetre, and it's so subtle. Um, that you don't get diagonals, you have to press really, really hard to get diagonals. So all I've done is cut some pieces of insulation tape, um, you know, that correspond, on, that fit underneath where the four, you know, directions are, um, and doubled it up. So we've got two layers of insulation tape there, and that's it. It's perfect. That make that's a very slight um, difference in the height of this here uh, against the D-pad. Um, it all still all fits together perfectly. It's not tight or anything like that, and it feels okay. Um, granted these things are not as good as the original ones, you know, these are a little bit more clicky whereas the other ones are just a bit softer, so softer silicon I think. Um, but that works perfectly now, I'll just show you once I've reassembled it. As you can see I can get diagonals now, no problems at all. Um, that's been cleaned up with some of the vanish there, I haven't used H2O2 on it. Um, I don't see any point really, it's, it's overall, it's not too bad, it's a little bit yellowed, you know, but these things were a cream anyway, you know, you can see from the original, uh, put some under there, you know, it was sort of a creamy sort of colour, yeah, it's a bit yellowed more at the back than the front, but actually, that's not bad that, and it's got all the original stickers and things on it, so, because uh, you'd need to remove those, you know, if I left those on there and then, uh, you know, get some H2O2 on there, they'd be, they would, those would look yellow, so I don't really want to ruin it, um, it's not bad really, it's just a shame that the face on this one's a bit messed up. Um, I did spot some replacement, like modern faces, like with, you know, they were themed, there's like some Zelda ones, some Mario ones for both the A and the B. They're a bit pricey, um, but I don't know, I might, yeah, I'm toying with the idea of replacing those, I might just keep them as originals. It's just a shame this one's so shot in this bottom right -hand corner here. Um, it's metal, isn't it? It's metallic. I, I suspect what you could probably do is s s smooth that down. I don't know what, you know, treat it with something to get rid of the paint. Um, and then I think you could probably treat that, you know, in one of those little baths, you know, to coat it with some gold or something. And then maybe stick stickers on. I don't know. That's a bit out of my capability, I think. But it's, all, it's possible from things I've seen previously of the, on the other channels and things. That looks like a candidate there for, um, what do they call it? Is it electrolysis or something where you... Um, you know, you can metal coat it. That's what I reckon you could probably do with that because it feels like it's metal underneath. The main thing is it's clean, it's functional. Um, my D-pads work properly now as well, you know, with the diagonals and stuff. Brand new um, D-pads in there. Um, fully recapped. Got the composite mod. And I've just, uh, the way I've done it is just left that fly lead coming out of the back there for the uh, audio. So, you know, I'm not interfered with the original case and stuff. It's easily revertible, if, you know, revertible if I wanted to. Um, anyway, I thought you'd find that interesting. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. So the other thing I'm going to do here now is put a piece of grounding tape underneath the PPU, actually. Um, it was a tip I found on one of the Assembler Games forums, uh, threads, I think. I don't know if you can see. Can you see the lines? Uh, it's hard to get it to display on here. Yeah, you've got lines uh, coming down, you know, down the display there, gel bars. Ever so slight. Um, it's not too bad on the blue there. I don't know if you can see that. It's just a little bit. Um, appreciate the 
compression is going to make it hard for you to see it actually. Well, as you can see, I've cut some of this uh, copper tape here um, down to size, so it's not too thick. You know, it's not too wide. Now the thing is, you've got to be careful. You know, I, I, what I've done is I've just peeled back the, the the back in there on the front bit here, but all the rest of it still. You know, you can move it around like this. Um, so it's a case of you know getting it in place, um, but make sure it's not too high up here so that it's short in any of these pins, not low too low down, so it's shorting out those pins. Uh, now if I push that all the way down, it almost comes to the other end. But actually, I can see, you know, just it's a case of just using your eye and just making sure you've got it in the right place. And then I should be able to just push this bit down here to stick it on. Uh, I'm going to try and do that off camera actually because it's going to be difficult trying to get it just in the right spot. There we go, so that's in just the right spot now. Uh, and I'll show you, it's worth doing a quick continuity test. You'll see here if we test continuity there, we get a dead short. But if we test any of the pins on the PPU here, nothing. nothing um, and then what I did is I pushed it right through it was just an overhang on this side so I've used a little bit of insulation tape just to get, hold it in this corner here on the board um, although it doesn't really need it because it's stuck down here but it, you know it could shift but actually you know I can see underneath there's a good you know there's a good if you look where this ends here there's a good distance from there to the pin edge and it's the same on the top top as well so all I need to do now is put a tiny blob of solder on here and join across to one of the nearby ground points perhaps on one of these caps over here so there you go there's the final result you can see I've joined it to where this little uh, bypass cap uh, there's two empty spots here it's the top top pin on either of those is the ground um, to join it up and I've just tested continuity again I've only got continuity to the ground pin which is correct so that's good to go so I'll give that a try so what difference did that tape add to the PPU? Uh, let me just start this hand, use the right control here. I don't think it's made any difference whatsoever. Can you see the little bands there? You might not be able to see them. There's still bands on the yellow and on the blues and things, so yeah, I'm a bit skeptical about that particular mod. Um, I did read though, that some people have got it working and others haven't. Um, you know, the blue there is pretty good actually. You know, there's very few uh, gel bars there at all. They're very, you know, they're hardly noticeable. A bit more when you scroll scrolling, I can see them there now. Um, but yeah, overall, that's, uh, it's still pretty good, so I'll just leave it in place. I, think. I can't bother removing it.